Right, well, hello, everybody. Uh, nice to see such a fantastic and large audience. So I, my name's Pierre Bolo, and I'm one of the researchers and teachers here in the School of Biosciences. Uh, my area is what's called structural biology, so I've spent my career looking at the atomic structure. Excuse me, yep. can you use another microphone? I'm finding it difficult. I can't hear you. Oh, I can use this one. How's that? Better. Better, right. So, I was just saying that um, I spent my career looking at the atomic structure of proteins, but very lately I've come across these things, fascinating things called bacteriophages. And I kind of, if I have any regrets, I wish I'd come across them earlier because they're absolutely um, fascinating things. So that's why I'm so happy today that Martha Clokey has come from the University of Leicester uh, and she's a world expert on bacteriophages and that's what she's going to talk about today. Um, so Martha's career I think is a, is a beautiful example of how if you follow your curiosity and your pa passion it's going to take you on a big adventure. So Martha started off, I think she came from her childhood home in the highlands of Scotland she went to study biology at the University of Dundee and then that took her on to doing a PhD where she was looking at different species of African violets in, in Uganda. So she was very much a plant biologist and the plant theme kind of continued. She went to do postdoctoral work at the Scripps Oceanography Unit in, in California where she was looking at a sort of plant related projects looking at photosynthetic bacteria, uh, marine ones. And that's where she first came across bacteriophages because she, she got hooked by these bacteriophages, which are viruses that kill the, the photosynthetic bacteria. So she kind of completely switched over to looking at bacteriophages and that took her ultimately to a professorship in Leicester, long way from plants, now spends a lot of her time thinking about human diseases, uh, human gut pathogens, and the kind of viruses that can kill some of these human pathogens. So all the way from African violets to gut pathogens in humans. And I th that's what she's gonna tell us about today, I hope. We're going to start off just to give you a little bit of background, uh, put things in context. So I'm part of a group that work mostly on bacteria and one of our major research themes is the antimicrobial resistance in bacteria. So we've, uh, some members of, some colleagues of mine have made a very nice animation which just will set set the context a little bit and then once the film is over Martha will come up and she'll give her presentation. Now before I forget I've been reminded to tell you that after the question and answer session there is wine behind the screens there so don't just disappear off you're more than welcome to stay for some wine and carry on the conversation. So I think we're ready to play the movie
Right, that should set the scene a little bit. So, Martha Clokey, thank you very much for coming to speak to us. Thank you very much for the invitation to come here. It's a great pleasure to be part of this nice uh, biofestival here at Sheffield. And thank you for the kind introduction. Talking of uh, African violets, when I was doing this study, one of the most surprising conversations I had I was on a train going to a plant taxonomy conference in Oxford. The person beside me asked me if what I did I said I studied African violets. He then spent the next hour or so telling me about all the violence he'd committed in Africa. <laughs> so I was very happy to get to my uh, <laughs> plant taxonomy conference. Um, but really, the, the questions that I was asking then in a botanical context was, why are things where they are and what are they doing? And although my organisms have changed, I think I still more or less asking the same questions, particularly with bacteriophages. So bacteriophages are viruses that specifically infect and kill bacteria. All bacteria have these natural viruses. And we know that we need new things that can kill bacteria because we're running out of antibiotics. We have a lot of problems with resistance. But not all bacteriophages were, were, have evolved to just do what we want them to do, just to infect and kill. So by studying them in the wild and trying to figure out the natural biology of how these viruses are interacting with the bacteria, we can learn really useful information. And what I want to do today is tell you a bit more about bacteriophages, the history, a bit of context, and then I'll end by telling you about some of the work that we're doing to further progress their transition from being interesting organisms to study to much needed antimicrobials. So we can see on my slide, this is the result of my most attractive collaboration, collaborative project. It was a project I did with a ceramic artist in um, she's called Amy Lax. She's currently the artist in residence of the Victoria and Albert. And she asked me if I could work with her because she wanted to create some sculptures of, of bacteriophages. So this is really based on some electron micrographs that I took. So we can see here um, her depiction of the bacterial cell. So this is, she made it yellow. This is a Clostridium difficile cell. So if you shine ultraviolet light on the bacterium Clostridium difficile, so it's an anaerobic bacteria that causes infectious diarrhea. And if you look at it under the, the ultraviolet light, it fluoresces this really beautiful yellow color. So that's why she made her sculpture that color. We can see bursting out of that bacteria are small viruses. So what's happened here is one virus is successfully attached to the bacterial cell. It's turned that bacteria into a viral making machine. It's released many bacteriophages, and then they will then look to find another bacterial cell. So it's exquisitely specific. Even within Clostridium difficile, there are perhaps at any one time 20 different types of this bacteria that are circulating around UK hospitals. And some phages will just infect one type. <laughs> so one of the things we do in our work is try to find those ones that can kill the clinically relevant and prevalent strains and the ones that can kill most aggressively. Now, if they can kill effectively, what you can see here, can you see these little holes? This is a plate of bacteria, it's a bacterial lawn, and here where you see a hole, there's about between 10,000 and 100,000 individual little viral particles. So, so there's been enough replication so you can actually see this by eye. So this is probably the most depressing slide I'm going to show you today in that it's predicted that if we don't do anything about the problem we have with antimicrobial resistance, by 2050, 10 million people every year are going to die from an infection that can't be treated. So that the um, size of the dots is depicting the, the size of the, um, the, the, the problem in, in different continents. You can see it's mainly a problem, going to be a huge problem in Africa, Southeast Asia. Um, it's also going to be uh, very, very high numbers of deaths. And it's not something that's going to happen by 2050, we can already see the most recent figures from 2019 showed that there was 1.2 million people 
digest from a, an antimicrobial inf resistant infection. And if you take into account comorbidities of an infection and another condition, you can see there are already more deaths than that. So this is a figure here. There are already more deaths from, from antimicrobial infections than there are from dementia, HIV, and malaria combined. So it's a problem now. We need quite radical solutions. Uh, and the reason really for the problem is that bacteria are becoming more resistant to antibiotics, largely through significant use in the agricultural sector and through overprescription. So both factors are contributing to this. Uh, and co-committant with that, um, there's just been a, a massive reduction in terms of the amount of new antibiotics that are discovered and then also the amount of new antibiotics that are coming onto the market. And this is largely because you, if you're a drug company, you don't make as much profit from an antibiotic as you do from a drug, say, for heart disease or other chronic diseases that people like diabetes that will, people will take for much longer periods of time. So people expect antibiotics to be cheap, cheap as chips, and they only use them for a week, and then there's things with stewardship. So you've actually got a really a sort of perfect storm for the, the real problem with a lack of antimicrobials in that companies are not motivated to invest, and there's very little work being done in this space. However, bacteriophages <laughs> do represent a whole new treasure trove of organisms that have not been looked at uh, to the, at all to the same extent in terms of being able to be used as novel antimicrobials. So if we don't use bacteriophages, what are, what, are, well, what, are, what are the options? So I said we're running out of antibiotics. What other things can we look at? Well, there was a report recently by the World Health Organization, and they showed that the main things that can be considered are oh, sorry, um, either antibodies, therapeutic antibodies, but they're not so easy to find and develop. There are only a few that have made it to the clinical trial stage. Potentially, we could manipulate the microbiome or immunomodulation could also be done, but again, they're quite complex approaches. Uh, and there's also fairly extensive small molecule screens. So there are some other modalities. However, bacteriophages really are a complete no-brainer. They, sh they should be studied because there's more of them than anything else on Earth. So this picture here shows some seawater, and you can see the, wee, the, the big blobs, they're bacteria, and the small, small particles, they're all bacteriophages. So this number, 10 to the 31, is a really big number to try and get your head around of, of the number of, of viral particles that are on Earth. So one thing I quite like is that if you put them head to tail, they make a, a path that's 200 million light years long. <laughs> and I said this, I, I was on um, a, a radio program with Brian Cox, and of course he said, really? <laughs> and, I, and I said, yes, I was fairly confident because my husband's an astronomer, and I'd gone through the maths quite carefully to figure out, because I was curious myself to try to bring this number to life. And he, he worked it out and, and, and agreed and was equally surprised by this really large number. So not only are there so many of them? They're just really genetically diverse as well. So I can still, I'll show you some pictures later on in my talk of genomes of bacteriophages. But I can still find genomes of bacteriophages where we can recognize perhaps five out of 200 genes. So there's huge amounts of genetic novelty. So these things that they exist and they're everywhere. And I thought I would show you a small video um, to explain a little bit more about this. This was um, a video that was made by a a filmmaker for one of my projects where we're looking to try to find phages that kill a bacteria called pasturella. So this is a, a major disease of fish. And in the same way we're developing phage products for, for humans, we're also looking at them to treat animals. Because if we can use phages instead of antibiotics in the agricultural sector, we stop that build up of antibiotic resistance at the beginning. So we break that, trans we can treat the animals and we can break that transmission. So hopefully this little video will work. Um, it's really beautiful. It's at the Stirling University site, a uh, field site where we were doing this project in Macrohanish in Scotland. Let's see if it plays. That's my brother. Phages are essentially bacterial killing machines and they're absolutely everywhere. So for example, in this pot, there are about 100 million bacteriophages. 
Now, they are incredibly specific. So, for example, Pasteurella, the bacteria we're interested in, there will just be a few phages that can infect it. And what they'll do, they'll attach to the surface, they'll inject their DNA, they'll turn that Pasteurella into a phage-making machine, and hundreds of phages will be released into the environment. So because phages are such useful bacterial killers, they cannot be used to remove disease. So over the last decade, we've been using them to remove diseases, both from swine and poultry. And now what we want to do is introduce them into the aquaculture industry, where they could again be very useful because you have a self-replicating medicine at the site of infection that doesn't kill the rest of the useful bacteria. So that's um, a little bit of the background towards bacteriophages. And Pierre mentioned in his introduction that he's interested in the structure of, of these organisms. And you can see why people are interested in the structure, because they're very beautiful. <laughs> these are just a whole bunch of bacteriophages that we isolated in one of our projects. We can see there's three major morphologies. There's these ones with contractile tails, there's lot ones with long, long, much longer non-contractile tails, and then we have, there's also many, this is another very common morphology where they just have these tiny little tails. These are called podo, which means foot podoviruses. So there's three different common morphologies of, of phages, and they have quite different strategies at the way they work uh, and interact with the bacterial hosts. So there have been some high-profile cases of bacteriophages being used clinically, and probably the biggest, uh, uh, most best-known example of, of that was this um, chap here, Tom Patterson, who a few years ago was traveling in Egypt, and he managed to contract a multidrug-resistant Acinetobacter. Now, they transferred him to Germany, and they couldn't, they couldn't treat him in Egypt, they couldn't treat him in Germany, they took him home to San Diego, and, and he was basically dying, they couldn't treat him. But his wife is, the, uh, is a dean of epidemiology in Berkeley. So she, had, she could pull a lot of strings <laughs> that people couldn't normally pull. So she, um, she got the American Navy involved. She got the, um, several companies throughout the States who are working on phage therapy development. And they managed to get um, some products, some phages from these different places that they treated Tom with and he lived. So she, um, they wrote a book together called The, the Perfect Predator, where, she, where they sort of pop popularized this story. And it highlights the case that, that, you know, that there are increasingly num these types of infections that just can't be treated. So no normally it would be probably, as a, somebody who was sick, it would be normally fairly difficult to uh, access phages within a Western context. And actually one of the people that provided phages for, for them is called Rai Young. He was the um, head of a research institute in, in Texas. And he made this funny comment that... that um, uh, like if he, the, 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 you know, to, in order to access phage therapy at the moment, you need sort of 200 nature papers. It's that sort of, you know, you, you, it's, it, it, it's, it's really, it's really, there's a massive um, need for phages, but because they have not been developed therapeutically, the average man on the street at the moment would struggle to access them. There have been some cases in, in the UK. There was a case a few years ago where there was a young girl who had a lung transplant, and on the back of that, she got a mycobacterium abscessus infection. And she was given just a, a couple of weeks to live, and her mum had heard of phages, and they wrote to uh, somebody called Graham Hatful, who runs uh, another bacteriophage research center in Pittsburgh, and he spent something like 30 years studying these TB phages. So they sent her some phages over, and they managed to uh, completely clear the infection. And she lived, she, um, she lived for another five years. Sadly, she did eventually die. It's quite complicated in the UK if you have CF. You change healthcare systems at, at age 18, so there was and there was more, more complications. But she had five five really. Um, good years instead of two weeks that she was uh, predicted to have. So what we want to really do is try to make phages much more um, available and part of mainstream medicine, not just accessible to the, to the few that, can, um, that, that, that are lucky enough to be able to do that. Now, I thought it might be useful, therefore, if I took you back to how antibiotics were originally discovered put this into context. So oops. we know that antibiotics were discovered in 1928 by Alexander Fleming. 
who famously was working late at night on a Friday and he was a wee bit tardy. He left his plates by a window. When he came in on Monday morning, he saw that there were some fungal spores that had landed on those plates and had killed the, the bacteria. And he had the nous to actually try and figure out what was doing it. He worked out it was a compound that was produced by penis, uh, penicillium, which then became penicillin. And <coughs> most antibiotics that we, um, oops, sorry, that we use today also come from other bacteria or other fungi. So that they're the product of bacterial bacterial warfare. Okay. Um, and antibiotic resistance is not new either. So I put this figure here to remind me to tell you that if you take Permian ice frost samples, defrost them and find bacteria, you actually see antibiotic resistance there. So bacteria within that soil environment, bacteria are competing for space. They'll try and send out chemicals to kill the other bacteria. And then those other bacteria will evolve strategies to stop themselves being killed by, by those different proteins. There's lots of mechanisms. So the concept and the idea of antibiotic resistance happened as, you know, way, way back when bacteria were evolving. We've just precipitated it by massively exposing bacteria to high levels of antibiotics. And this is how we measure them in hospitals. So this still happens today in, in if you have a an infection and you're lucky enough that your GP bothers to send your sample to the uh, hospital. Uh, you, and they, the way that they test is they have discs that are impregnated with antibiotics. So here, these antibiotics are all working. You can see they've got those big zones of killing on the plates. Here, this antibiotic is completely not working. Neither is that one. Uh, that one's working partially. So this is the way that, um, or still uh, one of the ways that we look for antibiotic resistance. So let me tell you about the history of phages. They were first discovered in 1915 by an Englishman called Twart. So he wasn't looking for them, but he found, uh, he was studying bacteria and he found these little glassy patches um, on his bacteria lawns. And he studied them. He realized he could move a glassy patch to another bacteria and it would kill it. And I mentioned this actually again. It was on, I think it was on another radio show. I mentioned uh, this observation was studied, but was, was that phages were first identified by Twart. And I got this lovely email from Twart, somebody, this, a man, he's a headmaster at York in a school there, and he is married to Twart's granddaughter. <laughs> so I got this lovely message saying, dear uh, Martha, I was listening to this radio show and I nearly fell off my chair because no one ever mentions my wife's grandfather. <laughs> they all mentioned this other guy, Felix Durell, as being the discoverer of bacteriophages. So as a result of mentioning this, I got to give prizes to the school children with the hook of meeting the, his wife, which is really nice. Um, and she talked about how they, the family has sort of grown up under the, the shadow of knowing their granddad had discovered something really important. But he got involved in the war and he never got to return to the subject. However, Felix Durell, he too independently discovered phages two years later. And he was able to go straight from discovering them to using them to treat uh, diseases in, in man and in, in animals. So in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, they were really actually, they went straight to using bacteriophages. So before antibiotics had been uh, made, uh, it was figured out how, that, how to use antibiotics, bacteriophages, you can see they really actually preceded um, that, the antibiotic era. However, Felix Sorel, then, um, he, he then trained someone called George Eliava. So this is the Eliava Phage Research Center in Tbilisi in Georgia. This is where, this is like Mecca for phage biologists. We love going here <laughs> because in this institute, many, uh, fa for, for, in, until the 80s, tons of phages were produced from here every year and they were sent all the way around the Soviet Union to treat mainly intestinal and uh, skin diseases. Unfortunately, uh, George Eliava was um, assassinated. Uh, rumor has it that he had an um, unfortunate choice of girlfriend. It was the same girlfriend as the head of the secret police at the time. Um, but anyway, it was a really, <laughs> it was a really turbulent time, and so uh, was, you know, was Stalin was really mass massacring huge numbers of the intelligentsia. So he unfortunately was killed. So Felix Drell was so upset by this that he never went back um, after this event. But um, phage therapy had at least, Eliava had done a really good job in establishing the institute and training scientists and doctors. So even despite that uh, very tragic history, the, uh, 
the subject carried on and pages were uh, used. And then during the collapse of the Soviet Union, actually, there's again loads of stories associated with that where the phage collections were maintained by people that, that just knew that they had to look after them despite the fact that it was uh, very often suboptimal. Okay, so that's a bit of the a uh, bit of the history. And it's, I think it's important to try and understand history when we're thinking about how to use phages because they, they're sort of, there's a lot of problems associated with why phages are not being used. And one of the, sort of, one of the aspects is really that because they've, been, because they've been around for so long, there's a sort of attitude, well, they've been around forever and they haven't worked yet, so why would we bother studying this old thing that kind of happened in, <laughs> in sort of Eastern Europe and Russia and Georgia? But I think we need to understand that that's, that's what happened then, and I'll talk about why we should be studying it now. Oh yeah, I want to show you first of all a little movie now on um, how bacteriophages actually work. And I really like this film. You saw in the little one where I was explaining about phages, a very simplistic cartoon, that this movie is based on about 20 years worth of protein crystallography at the University of Purdue. And it just shows exactly how bacteriophages recognize their hosts and how, what happens following that recognition. So the relationship, as I said, it's very specific. It depends initially on the ability of the tail, tips of those tail fibers to find the right bacteria. And when it finds the right one, can you see the shape of that sheath changes? The, the, the sheath contracts, and then DNA is forced from the head of that virus through that tube into that bacteria. Uh, that bacteria is no longer... Uh, free, it's been genetically reprogrammed at this point to, to then make viruses. So the pros of using them in a therapeutic context are the fact that they're very specific, and this means that if you have a, an infection caused by one bacteria, you can just remove that bacteria and leave the rest of the bacteria intact. So we now know that we have perhaps 2,000 species of bacteria in our guts, and antibiotics will obliterate the target, but many other bacterial species as well. So, you know, you often feel quite ill when you take antibiotics uh, because you lose your commensal microbiome. They're also, they, they, they're as effective at treating antibiotic resistant bacteria as they are those that are not resistant. So they're really good for bacteria that we can't treat anymore. They're also really good at treating biofilms. So often when you get an infection, it's a, like a slime of, of bacteria that are growing in a very slow way, and they've extruded lots of proteins and DNA, and it's hard for antibiotics to penetrate. But because bacteriophages have evolved to kill bacteria in the wild, they're very good at, uh, they have a lot of enzymes that can break down those matrices. Um, and actually, phages and antibiotics are really good when you use them together. You get a great synergy between the two, and the phages very often make the antibiotics a lot more effective. Uh, a little bit flippant, but I, I feel it's really important to make the point that phages exist, right? That we don't, have to, we don't have to invent something. We just have to look at what's in nature and then figure out how it's doing it. And then we can learn from these very simplistic uh, viral predators, or bacterial predators. So the disadvantages, however, is that because they're very specific, you need to know what you're trying to treat. So there have not been very many phage clinical trials, randomized controlled clinical trials. And those that have been done have largely failed because the wrong phages were used. So Nestle funded a, a massive trial. They were trying to, I think, make amends for all of that work. You know, remember when they, they funded, um, they were trying to push formula milk in, third, in developing countries. Uh, so in a way to try to say sorry, they tried to come up with a, a phage product to uh, <laughs> help people that had diarrhea. But they used, they did a big, funded a big trial in Bangladesh and it failed because they did not know what disease it was they were, what was causing the, the diarrhea, therefore they used the wrong phages. So you've got to have that much tied to connection. And then for many bacterial species, they're quite hard to find. Um, and because they haven't been used much, particularly in a Western context, there's a lot of issues to try to resolve regarding some of these more logistical issues like the formulation and delivery, and also how do you regulate them? They don't fit into the standard regulatory pathways. However, it's been, a, it's been an interesting year for phages and phage research, and it started with this um, government inquiry. So this was me heading down to, to Parliament to present evidence um, as part of a, an inquiry 
from the Committee of Science and Technology. So every year the government has one inquiry as to an area of science that why, why is the UK not investing in this and, and what should it be doing differently? So it was really interesting to be part of this process. First of all, they had, I, was, I was part of a panel that was giving um, an academic perspective. So they had all, all the, there was a the select committee of, it was a cross-party um, committee of, diff of different MPs and they'd read all the written evidence that was submitted. And they asked really good questions. There was also a clinical panel and a commercial panel. Um, if anybody has sleep issues, the whole thing got recorded. <laughs> so it's actually quite interesting because they had, there was three sessions. The next one was, then they had um, doctors from all over the world and they said they'd never had a committee from so many different time zones. So they had uh, doctors from um, Israel, from Australia, from uh, different places in the States, several places across Europe as well. So they. They talked to them about how they, how they used phages and what we could be doing differently in the UK. Um, and then the final panel was from the funders and the regulators and also the policymakers. So the thing is, how do we, how do we embed bacteriophages within the government antimicrobial stra strategy document? So as well as being busy with science over the last few years, I've had to sort of uh, get out of the lab and a little bit do... Um, uh, lobby at this level so people are aware of this technology. But it's actually been good fun to do that. And the other thing that I did was I established a phage centre at Leicester. Uh, there was a competition to establish centres which we just aware the universities are going to assemble um, sort of critical area, uh, uh, more resource so we can progress better within this field. So the idea of our phage centre is that we formalise our banks. So if you, some of you might recognise, I don't know your favourite bacteria here, we've, we've got really big collections of phages that target both enteric pathogens, so, so things that cause um, gut diseases, but also respiratory pathogens and things that are important in agriculture as well. And what we're doing, we're creating these biobanks and we're standardising the way that we collect information on these bacteriophages. So it'll ultimately allow us to try to figure out which are the best ones to use and why. And then, as I said, we've also <coughs> doing a bit of work to make sure we have, we understand the pathways to translation, to make sure we collect the right data. Uh, and then there's a, an element of education as well. So largely the things that we're doing in the center are a, lo a lot of discovery, looking at the genome and building those banks. And then we have to make sure that the phages work in, t in the relevant conditions. Okay, so there's no point in just making sure they kill in flasks. We want to make sure they're going to kill in a disease context. So we develop lots of models. And also because I said that phages are so specific, you can't just use one. You have to use combinations. But some combinations of phages will work really well together. And others, the phages fight against each other. So you can't, um, you can't use those combinations. Uh, increasingly, we're also, when we understand why a phage works the way it does, we can then use genetic engineering to uh, potentially widen the properties of one particular phage. So we are also pursuing that route. And then there's the um, aspect of, of developing an actual product. So this involves working with the end user. So in a way, I've done a lot more. I'm not presenting data on this uh, today just because in the interest of time, but I'll happily talk more with, if, if anyone's interested. We've done about five trials in poultry, each trial with about 2,000 birds. Um, so we're working with the end user to see how, how those um, feed companies or veterinary companies would need, would need to have a product that farmers are used to using. Um, so we've been sort of un understanding those aspects and then help develop the product. And then we're also, we've got some really useful data there in, things, in terms of things like delivery and dose response that we can then imply, um, employ into a more human context. So that's the three aspects of what we're doing within the center. Because really we want to know how. <laughs> I've now convinced you that phages are everywhere and they're natural part of the, the microbiome. And then the same way that I would say over the last 15 years or so, we're really aware that our microbiome is playing very useful functions. We know it's priming our immune system, it's helping us with digestion, all those things that were in that movie at the beginning. But actually, I think of the bacteria, they're almost like the kind of, they're like the sort of um, puppets. The phages are like the puppeteers. <laughs> they're probing those bacteria in all sorts of different ways. They're changing the way they behave. They're manipulating the physiology. They're controlling the population dynamics. They're impacting the evolution. So, 
some of them, a small subset of them, are really the aggressive killers, and that's ones we're trying to find. So how do we go then from that to that? How, how does your GP, when you go in there and you've got a really bad chest infection, how do they know, will, will they know which, <laughs> how will they be able to access a bacteriophage product? Because this is where we want to get to. I thought I'd show you here, these are how they use phages in Georgia. Um, I meant to bring some actually, because every time I go to Georgia, they always give me pots of them. They always say, oh, these are for when your kids get sick. And the way that they get over the specificity issue is that there'll be phages, about six different phages for six different bacteria. So their mixtures will have more than 40 different bacteriophages in there. And this means that although they're at a low level, you'll take a little bit of this, um, this, this virus, it's, just a, it's essentially a virus lysate. So it's bacteria that have been given viruses, the, the bacteria have lysed, and then they combine all that stuff together. Um, and then the hope is that when you put that, that fluid onto, some, onto a wound or into an infection, the right virus will, will then find its host and it will amplify. So that's the way they use those products. Um, or also, how do we go for, how do, how do we make products in poultry uh, or the aquaculture industry? There's also people um, making phage products for things like Disulfa vibrio. It's a bacterium that rots uh, pipes in, in the oil industry. That there's a lot of problems with corrosion of the pipes due to these bacteria. So you can really find phages for any, any place where a bacteria is out of balance. It doesn't necessarily have to be just a human host. Agriculture is another major problem, especially in, in places, uh, hot countries where um, food just rots. And so so you, the farmers go to the effort of growing this food and it's just rotted before it can get to the, the consumer. So, but probably actually, even in the UK, if you buy your potatoes from Sainsbury's or Tesco, you probably had a phage product. <laughs> so there's a company based in Scotland that makes uh, phages and in the last step of, of the potato production before they're put into bags, instead of chlorine, they spray, uh, the phages can be sprayed onto these potatoes. And if you just look at data in terms of the number of potatoes that were returned to the shop um, following purchase due to rotting, the, the phages work better than the chlorine spray. This is um, also how they're used. You can use phages as sort of, if we look at how they're used in other countries where they're allowed to use phages, on humans, as I said, you can buy these vials. You can buy them impregnated into dressings. So for this is to treat uh, sort of nasty, nasty wounds that, that you can use them for that. Um, this is uh, a friend of mine called Ben Chan, who's based at Yale University in um, New Haven. And what they're doing there, I find quite a clever way of using phages. There, if somebody is has a multi-drug resistant chest infection, and they've shown that they, there's no other way that they can treat this. They have a, an agreement with the FDA, so the regulator agency in the, in the States, the um, Food and Drug Administration, that they can use phages. Now, the reason why the bacteria are resistant to antibiotics is that they pump them out. So what, what Ben's done is they found phages that attach to the pumps. So the only way that the bacteria can um, evolve resistance to those phages is to mutate that pump and then they become sensitive again to the antibiotics. So this is what, what Ben's doing. What, what they, they've treated, I think, about 150 patients now um, using this mechanism of, of using antibiotics and then phages and then antibiotics again. So what are we doing now in our context in, in the UK? How do we how do we get phages used and what should we, what should we focus on? It was a conversation I had at length with this person here, Melissa Haynes. So she's half the time in my lab as a phage biologist, but half the time she's an infectious disease consultant in the hospital and the Leicester Royal Infirmary. And we decided we would work on urinary tract infections because they're caused largely by two different bacteria, E. coli and Klebsiella. They're both quite easy to find bacteriophages for and they're both increasingly resistant to antibiotics. And it's a major problem. It costs the NHS about 400 million pounds in terms of by treating the number of people. There's about 175,000 people are hospitalized every year. 
And actually, half of all the sepsis cases in the country are thought to originally that infection was a, was a urinary tract infection. Now, we don't want to use phages initially for treating sepsis because you'd have to inject them. And there's a lot more tests and uh, research that you need to do to inject phages than you do if you use them topically um, or directly into the, the site of infection because there's a whole load more you need to understand about the immune reactions. Now, um, anyway, so we decided we would work o o on this. And I put this here just at well, to, 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 to show you the complexity of these kind of a projects. We have an infectious disease doctor, we have a public health doctor, because there's no point in having a project where you have a phage solution where you don't need it because you've already got something that's cheaper or can be done. We have a consultant urologist, Pravisha Rathinda, so she's really interested in, 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 she sees increasingly patients she can't treat, so she's working with us to provide us with samples of, of urine and catheters and access to, to, to um, uh, patients that Mel can, can work with. Uh, then this is the, um, the data I'm going to show you is, has been collected by these two PhD students. So this is Karen. She spent a long time in Israel doing experimental phage therapy there before she came to our lab to do her PhD. And Risk is from Indonesia. She's uh, been developing a mouse model for us to collect safety and efficacy data, which will then allow us to do a human clinical trial. So the steps are really, we've been finding the phages, um, making the cocktails, and then testing them in relevant systems. So just the same as I, as I told you we did, but I'll, I'll now show you some examples of what we're actually doing for this project. So I thought I'd show you the sampling pictures. Otherwise, the first question I always get after my talks is, where do you find the phages? Um, so <laughs> phage biologists do not hang around very salubrious places. In fact, my husband used to say, when I first met you, you studied tropical botany, and now you hang around sewage works. <laughs> so <laughs> arguably, my life's got a lot less glamorous, but it's uh, equally fascinating. So if not more so. So this is a, a muck heap. It's muck heap. Horse muck is really good for pseudomonas phages. Um, Oh yeah, this is, a, so Clostridium difficile is an anaerobic bacterium, so therefore you can find phages in anaerobic mud. So my children have been very good at helping me over the years sample, they love sampling phages, and as do my students. This is a project looking for Lyme disease phages. So Lyme disease is caused by a bacterium called Borrelia burgdorferi. It's carried by ticks. So the first thing that happens when a tick bites you is they regurgitate a little bit of their insides. And if, they have, if they're infected, you will then get Lyme disease, or you, you may get it. So the, way, the best way to study phages is to do either drag netting to get, get the bacteria, or um, you can wear these special trousers that the, uh, and then the ticks are attracted to you, but you, that you're, you're not um, susceptible to the, to the bites through those trousers. So we were collecting the ticks to collect the bacteria to collect the phages. Um, yeah. So we, we then, to find the phages, you then grow them in the bacteria that you want to kill. So this is a, a culture of bacteria you want to kill, and we grow it overnight. And then we look, in the same way that I showed you with the antibiotic, we look for the, um, the whole, the zones of killing. And we pick a little area here, and then we purify it. So I'm going to show you another small video, which I'll talk over, because this sound was actually in um, Danish, which I didn't think was very useful, but it allows me to show you what we, the, the, some of the ways that we process these phage samples. So this is, can you see there's really beautiful phage plaques on that plate there. So you can see the sampling, it's really not very high tech. You literally just scoop up soil, water, anywhere where that bacterial number might be high. Um, you can find the water, you can find phages within that. And then this is actually in our um, electron microscope in Leicester. So looking, uh, when, when we get to the point where we purified phages, we, it's always really nice to actually finally see them. So we always filter the water to get rid of any bacteria. So we put them through a 0.2 filter um, because no bacteria, well, very few bacteria can survive that. And then what's been really great is that until recently, it was still quite expensive and difficult to sequence bacteriophages. Some of you microbiologists amongst you may know that recognize this is Andy Millard loading a nano, um, an Oxford nanopore flow cell. So we can take these little that whole little tiny thing is, um, is, 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 is now a miniaturized sequencing platform. So you, I can take these now. I, I've worked for the last seven years with a, a charity called Phages for Global Health, where we've gone all around, um, that we've taught phage biology to doctors, vets, and food microbiologists in different, um, mainly in different African universities. 
the idea is that instead of going to, to places where there's problems with resistance and saying, buy my phages, we just teach microbiologists how to find them and how they might be useful within their own research programs. And now I can take these flow cells and we can actually go right from isolating to having genome information within a two-week program. So I did, <laughs> I did take these flow cells to, uh, the first time I took them with me somewhere, it was to Tanzania, and I got a lot of problems with immigration. Um, but after about a one hour, lecture to them about why bacteria pages were so important. <laughs> Just go, <laughs> leave my airport. <laughs> um, but that's been, that's been really useful because, um, sorry, we can, now, we can now straight away from quite quickly after we have these bacteria pages, look to see what, they're, what is in the genomes. So we've been building lots of different bioinformatic tools to try to compare um, these genomes because they can be very, very different from each other. So they need bespoke tools compared to when you study bacteria or other organisms. And what you've got here are these beautiful sets of, um, I call them phage clouds. Uh, and so this is, if you look here, these, each, this is all a, different, a few different representative bacteria. And each dot, let's go with salmonella, each dot represents a bacteriophage genome, okay? Now, if there's any connection, those bacteriophages are related to those. If there's not, they're completely unrelated. So the main one thing you can see by looking at these is that each different bacteria will have about 20 completely unrelated types of bacteriophages that infect it. So a lot of the time, the work that we do in our lab is then trying to understand, well, which type is if infecting it in the way that we wish, which type can infect it and the bacteria can't evolve resistance, which type can infect particular settings um, of, of infection. And you can see, you can also just see, just very simplistically, you can see different types of patterns. So can you see staph is much more, um, there's more interconnection because those phages have got different life cycles than uh, a lot of the life cycles that are found in salmonella, for example. So we're starting to build up a, a picture of this genomic information. And this massively d differentiates what we can do now to when phages were being discovered before antibiotics. Because that was really just very blind, like does it kill or doesn't it kill? <laughs> Whereas now we can actually understand, well, can it, can it kill and why is it killing and how is it killing? So we're really in a very different space to be able to understand how, how phages work. And um, also, when we find phages, one of the things I do really quite quickly now is try to think what I will need my phage to do. I know it's got to have a broad host range. I know it's got to not promote resistance. I know it's got to be stable. It's got to be able to be made to a high titer. Because if your phage can't be made at a high level, then you're not going to be able to make something that's commercially viable as a product. So what we're doing, what I do, spend a lot of time doing now <laughs> in different projects is trying to see, well, would, should we use those types of bacteria or those or, or those? So trying to identify the features that are associated with genetic traits. And then I mentioned uh, that we have to look at phages in combination with each other because you need to use more than one phage. So uh, as Pierre said, there will be a drinks reception quite soon. I've only got a few more slides to show you. <laughs> so you might be thinking about glasses of wine or cocktails. Um, so we call a mixture of phages a phage cocktail. And what this is showing you here in this pie chart, can you see these the different colors are representing the different, the proportion of the different serovars, the different types of salmonella that are circulating within the poultry industry. So if you want to treat poultry, it's no point in having a phage that can only treat that particular type. You need a phage that can target all of them. So we spend a lot of time looking at um, how they work individually. And I can explain this. This looks a little bit complicated, but it's not. It's showing you, we, we plot, we understand virulence according to, um, we call it a virulence index. So if, if, this, if the number is close to the edge, that phage is really good, okay? So when we look at individual phages, this is three individual phages in orange here, here and underneath this red dot, actually. So individually, these phages are quite good. So then we test them, and then we test, well, what about when we combine them here, here, and here? And then what happens when we put them together? Do they still maintain their ability to, to be able to kill correctly? So we spend a lot of time building up these careful combinations of phages. We then test them in all sorts of different models. So we use biofilm models. This is just bacteria growing on a cover slip, a glass cover slip. 
We also spent a lot of time looking at epithelial cells, so layers of, of skin cells. So for gut diseases, we'll look at um, uh, uh, gut uh, skin cells. With lung diseases, we'll look at the skin cells that uh, cell lines derive from the lungs and so on. Because when you look at uh, through the microscope at this, you'll see these are the actual, these are the human cells, and these are the bacteria that would cause an infection within those contexts. So the phages have got to be able to find the bacteria within that matrix. So we've done a lot of really interesting work looking at those dynamics and interactions. And that's another really important area, an active area of research within this field. Now, we, we also use this model of infection quite a lot. It's a slightly unlikely looking uh, model. It's, it's using a, a type of moth called a galeria. And I started using this because I had somebody who came, he wrote to me, he was from India, and he wanted to use phages in the silk industry because he was from Assam. And in Assam, they have two industries that dominate. One is um, the silk moths, they make silk, and the other is tea. But they fog the tea plantations with so much insecticide, it damages the poor silk moths. So he wanted to come and see if he could use phages to protect the microbiome of the silk moth. <laughs> so I wanted to try to, to sh I showed him how to isolate phages, and I wanted to try and show him um, how we might use them in a caterpillar. But the, his, his, the, the, the silk moths are so specific, you, couldn't even, you can't even move them within, um, like from outside to inside where he was looking at them. So we couldn't transplant, bring those silk moths here. So we used uh, this, this infectious, it was a known model for infection, but it hadn't been used much before, phages before. But we've now got it working really, really well. You can see when they're healthy, they're this color. And then you, we work out how much bacteria to give them. And we can use, deliver, deliver, deliver bacteria to them in different, way, to them in different ways. And when, they, and when they're dead, they go black. Um, there's no ethics needed for these experiments. They cost five pounds for 200. Uh, you buy them in Pets R Us. So they're really, really good. And they correlate really well to higher, more complex animal data as well. So we've used them a lot to figure out lots of things in terms of number of phages. Uh, we use artificial gut models. Um, and I'll tell you, I'm going to end by showing you some data for our urinary tract infect, um, infection project using some mice, mouse data at the end in a couple of slides time. Um, I wanted to show you, actually first, how bacteria, phages, and antibiotics could be used together. Um, oops. Because if we were to do a clinical trial in patients that have urinary tract infections, it would not be ethically um, desirable to stop those patients having the antibiotics that they were on. So if we could do a trial where we just give patients phages and see if it improves their, um, their wellness, to see if they don't then relapse into infection as much, then if we can do an, an, um, a trial where we, we don't have to stop standard treatment, this is going to be quite desirable. So we need to understand how phages and antibiotics will work together. I gave you that example uh, in Yale, whereby you could use them one after the other, but actually just using them together, you can see quite dramatic results. So the way that we did these experiments is we worked with the, the standard plates that Thermo Fisher use uh, to look at antimicrobial susceptibility testing for different bacteria. These are the plates they use. Um, you can see it sort of probably more clearly in my schematic. You basically look to see the, um, how much antibiotics the bacteria can still survive in. So our hypothesis was that perhaps if bacteria can grow, you can see bacteria can grow in the green, can phages convert more green into red by being able to more effectively kill those bacteria. When we looked at this, we can see, so we compared bacteria and antibiotics, and then bacteria, antibiotics, and phages to these plates. And you can see quite clearly here, so this is particularly, this is an antibiotic called um, nitrofuritonin. Um, and you can see that the bacteria, where you see that growth, that's the bacteria that can actually grow. Um, so it can grow at 32 micrograms per milliliter. It's just about growing at 64. Um, but you can see when you add this particular phage, so those phages haven't had a huge impact, but those phages have completely eliminated the growth. So by combining the phages with the antibiotics, you can see it's made that antibiotic effective again. Uh, but it's interesting, we've got about 10,000 data points now. It's quite <laughs> dependent on the strain and the phage and the antibiotics. So what we're doing now is working out what those ideal combinations are going to be.
Another thing that uh, has been enormously interesting when we've been working with this consultant neurologist I mentioned is to actually get hold of infected catheters from patients who have a urinary tract infection because for these experiments we haven't this is just the way they are. This is the way they come. We just literally get the catheters, we check that they've got E. coli, um, and then we drip our phages through in this artificial bladder. This is an artificial bladder. This is a bit of real catheter from the, from the patients. And we've been working with some uh, people that work on a cat's micro CT scanning based at the University of Warwick to then actually be able to analyze in a non-destructive way those catheters. So here are some views of looking, uh, so this is looking down the annulus of that catheter. Can you see, see the blue? That's before they were treated. And this is after they were treated. And again, you can see they're covered in this biofilm before, beforehand. I think you can probably see it most clearly actually in this picture. So it's like a, um, because the bacterial biofilm has a complete, has a, is, is quite dense, um, it hasn't even had to be stained. It's literally the natural biofilm before and after phage treatment. So one way we could use phages would be to actually line the catheters with phages before the patients were given them to actually stop infection. Or you could treat the patients following an infection. So I like this. I thought this data, uh, my student was really excited to see this data and I could see why because it, it, um, it's just it's showing you that you're, we're taking this natural uh, community, we're using the phages that we spent ages developing this cocktail mm. and working out the best phages in the most broadest host range and they're, they're working on very close to human uh, samples. So the last thing I'm going to show you is uh, some very recent data that we've got looking at urinary tract infections in a mouse model. So I've put some papers here just to, to show you that, um, that there is a history of looking at infections in, in mouse bladders. And the reason why we wanted to, to do this is because if we can get put <laughs> establish an infection in a mouse, we know that that, that level, we can really accurately monitor that level of infection. It's quite hard actually to put uh, to infect a mouse directly into its bladder. You have to be, have be very uh, skilled as an animal technician to be able to do this. So I thought this quote, I quite like, this is a very accurate quote. Induction of mouse urinary tract infection by transferial inoculation of bacteria is a long established but technically demanding procedure. It is, but um, it allows you to collect um, a lot of data that's not, that can be quite clean because we know the levels of infection and we know that those phages, that amount of phages have got to that um, specific area we're trying to treat. And um, the way that we did this experiment is we had mice, we established an infection in them with Klebsiella. We then, uh, two days later, when the infection was established, we just gave them one dose of phages, okay? Now, what, I didn't know this until we started doing these experiments, but you can actually train mice to urinate on demand. So normally, mice just wee all the time. But if you give them a special little mouse cocoa pop, <laughs> you can, um, from when they're little, you, they can just, they'll urinate to get the cocoa pop, and then you can collect the urine. So it allows you to uh, get lots of data <laughs> to see how effective the, the, the phages are um, over a long time period. So you've you, you given them the bacteria, and then the data I'm going to show you is just with, literally just with one dose of phages. But it's very clean and I think quite impressive data. We, can you see, it? This is, so this is looking at the bladder of the mouse. So this is, um, the, the red is the animals that just got the bacteria. So you can see after a week, they're still infected. Look, it's completely, the phages have completely eliminated the infection there. This is with the, uh, all of that data from the, 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 um, over, over time from collecting the urine. And you can see that the infection is cleared. And again, we can see that it's cleared when we look at the, uh, the kidney. And then the bottom chart is showing you that phages indeed can be recovered from these areas as well. As well. So it might just look like three plots on a, on a figure, but this is like, uh, I can't tell you how many years worth of well, I can tell you, it's about five years worth of you know, finding them, working out the host range, working out the combinations, working them out in different models, trying to get the right things. And then, so it's, it's really nice now. So what we're doing is we're doing the histopathology to make sure that, the, um, that, 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 they, that they look safe, they're not causing any 
um, bad effects to, to the cells of the, or to the mice in general. Um, and we were now working with the, um, with the MHRA, so the Medical Healthcare Regulation, Medicine Healthcare Regulation Agency, because they are the people that will regulate the ultimate product to be able to get it then um, used in, in a wide spread human context. So they're helping us uh, with telling us which data we need to collect next. Oops. So hopefully, in my lecture, I've shown you today the phages have got this long history of use. Um, they, there's, there's, there's a real it, it, need to get them into mainstream medicine, but we can do it in an ecologically informed but mess, um, and also mechanistically informed way. But there's, there's really, there's still, I've tried to not glide over the complications and the challenges. Because I found when I started my lab 15 years ago, there was no clinical interest. And now I've got more doctors saying to me, Martha, I need phages. My patients are dying. You know, give me phages. But I don't want to give them phages until I know we're giving them the right phages. <laughs> so um, there's a, a, a real, uh, it's, it's nice within the UK and other countries, there's a lot more work in this area, which will then inform the fact that we'll be able to use good cocktails. And I've just shown you a couple of examples of, of, of their efficacy. So I'll just, I'd just like to end with this nice picture of our lab. Uh, this was last year on our Christmas outing with a alpaca farm. It's quite, quite amusing to um, introduce a bit more chaos into a fun but chaotic lab anyway. Uh, um, acknowledge my, the people that fund this research, the, the students and uh, postdocs who've collected a lot of the data. And thank you very much for your attention. Happy to take any questions after. Well, thank you very much, Martha. That was tremendous. And I look forward to having you back in a year or two when you're going to report on the first proper <laughs> clinical use of... Yeah. Um, I'm going to go and s try and sit in the Michael Parkinson chair there. And hopefully my <laughs> microphone will be working. And um, open the floor for questions. In the front there. We've got, a, we've got a microphone roaming around. Thank you. Um, because um, most parasites eventually evolve to a point where they don't damage the host and live together, I'm wondering if there's any evidence to suggest that phages might ultimately farm the bacteria rather than killing them. Yes, that's a very good question. So the question was... <laughs> In general, when you look at parasite strategies, do they? Um, it's not really in the interest of that parasite to ultimately demolish everything. So, could, can, it, there's evidence that parasites don't ultimately harm their hosts. So do phages do a similar thing and farm their bacteria? There, I think that there, um, there's a whole spectrum of aggressiveness within bacteriophages, and certainly um, the, the level of complexity between bacteria and the way that they interact with hosts is, 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 is mind-blowing. When I started studying phages sort of 20 years ago, we were told there were three different ways that bacteria could defend themselves against phages. I think there's now 126 different recognized ways that busy people think <laughs> characterizing. So I, I think understanding that landscape and either designing phages that can counteract that or choosing phages that have got the strategy that we wish to um, is, is going to be essential in terms of selecting the phages that, that we use. So I, I think that I really love genetic engineering and synthetic biology, but I think there's a lot we can understand first to try to identify those phages that ultimately would, would have a, a strategy that's not just that sort of subterfuging and hiding. <laughs> a whole, whole sort of range of ecolog ecological strategies. So you mentioned it a couple of times, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about resistance and how fast do bacteria become resistant to, to a particular phage? Yeah, so it depends on the phage. Um, so the question was how, how quickly do phages become bacteria become resistant to phages? Um, it depends what the phage uses. Uh, as, a, as a receptor, as its primary receptor, and also um, how you use that phage. So, you, so in, in general, most bacteria will become resistant within pretty short time periods. So you're talking, I don't know, over a 24 hour time period, you'll see generally a bacteria will become um, resistant. I mean, bacteria are just really good at, at doing things to, um, to, to uh, counteract what's attacking them. However, in general, 
the cost of resistance to a bacteria can be quite high. So they might be phage resistant, but then there'll be a rubbish pathogen because they can't invade anymore. Uh, and then the other thing that we've shown is that even if you just use two phages, you can massively reduce that amount of resistance. And then also the way that we study those resistance, it can also dictate the forms of resistance that you get. So if you study, if you're just looking in, in, in flasks, sort of, in, sort of in, in vitro situations, you'll see one type of resistance. But if you look in a more complex animal setting, there'll be a, a different method, especially within the contracts, if you increase that the micro, my, amount of microbes. So it, it is, it's definitely a, a consideration that should be factored into the design and the development of a, a phage cocktail. But I think that by, um, you know, the more, the more we can understand, then we can actually um, not witness it. So in my chicken experiments, uh, a commercial chicken takes 42 days from uh, chick to slaughter. And we, we, we've given them phages throughout that whole 42 days and not seen any resistance by the end of 42 days when they've had it from, the, from, their, from day one. Right at the back there. Hi, so can a phage eventually infect an eukaryote, or is there something that prevents them from infecting eukaryotes and just stick to bacteria? Yeah, that's a very important question, which is, can a, can a phage eventually infect a eukaryote? The answer is no, <laughs> because they're so, they, they have to be, a, a, the outside of a eukaryotic cell is so different to the outside of a bacterial cell. They, would, they can't infect it. And then also the machinery that it needs to access is very, very different. However, what is, um, Interesting is that they certainly, they don't not interact with human cells at some level. So you, the dogma used to be that phages don't, um, there's no way that they can infect, which is still true. But it looks like they, the potential, there was a, a really interesting paper that came out about perhaps three, three or four weeks ago that showed that it looked like can, some cancer cell lines are potentially feeding on bacteriophages. So they, they see they, they're perfectly capable of crossing human cells. But they, they can't, they can't, there's no way a phage could just go rogue and start killing the, the mammalian host because they can't do that. But I think looking at the interactions between human cells, it's going to be useful to work out how we can, um, you know, use them and avoid any problems. I'm right at the front here. Um, so you mentioned that the phages can um, enter or interact with the uh, antimicrobial, uh, antibiotic pump on the yeah. bacteria. And I know they can attack bacteria through uh, via a conjugative pilus. Yeah. Is there another, are there other like bacterial surface structures that they like to enter through or use? Yes. Um, so the question is, they, they can, how, what, what are the different things that bacteriophages can use to get in? So yeah, they, 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 they can use a whole range of, of proteins or lipopolysaccharides, um, different sugars that bacteria have. So there's, there's lots of different things that they can use as their, as their primary receptor. And very often they'll have a primary receptor and a secondary receptor as well. Um, and different types of phages seem to preferentially use certain um, some, some will use proteins and others will pre prefer to use, um, well, either sugars or actually the, so for example, staph phages, are, they're, they're absolutely fascinating because they'll be able to attach or not, not attach depending on extremely minuscule changes in glycosyl and uh, glycosylation. So um, bacterial surface structures often have sugars or acetyl groups attached to them. And then you can see that there's sort of there's a whole arms race that's going on when the, the bacteria will do something and then the, and then the phage won't be able to infect it and then, and then it'll find a way to infect it so that you know, it'll change and change and so on. So um, yeah, they can really exploit most, most surface structures. And also some of them can go in through the flagella of bacteria that have flagella as well. They can have that as a primary receptor. Thank you. When we give these to patients, if you give them intravenously at some point, is there any evidence that the patient mounts a sufficient immune response to inactivate the yeah, virus? Yeah, they're, they're, um, the most work that's been done in that area has been done in, in Poland, at the, in Wrocław, um, where there's been a, a sort of experimental uh, phage lab that's been able to use phages under compassionate patient usage and I think they've collected data from se several hundred patients and 
they certainly, um, it, it's a little, it's a, it's, it's a bit, little bit difficult to sort of unpick everything, but certainly you, there is evidence that you, you do mount an immune response if you give that phage more, more than once, so that therefore they'll change that, um, the phage that they use if they, if, they, if they want to use it. And the other thing that, in, so there was, even actually in Georgia, there was one particular staph phage that they found that uh, was, um, it, it did not elicit a strong immune reaction. So that was one, they only had one phage that they were allowed to use um, intravenously. Um, so there has been some work where people look for sort of long circulating DNA, uh, sorry, long circulating phages within, within the bloodstream and, and, and look, look for that. But it's not totally straightforward. They've also looked to see um, people's antibodies towards phages and how that correlates to efficacy. And, and it's, it's not totally clear um, what those relationships are. But there, there were some, some of the centers that have sprung up in the States. There's one center in San Diego. They're desperate because obviously doctors want to use, you want to use phages systemically. Um, I don't know. My, my, my feeling based on what I know is that I, I think that it, it's probably not the simplest use of phages initially. I can see that it's really tempting to want to use them there. And perhaps if you've got someone who's going to die, there's a risk-benefit analysis. Maybe, maybe it's okay if you've, it, at least to use them once to try and reduce that amount of infection. But I think it's, it's, it's just not as straightforward. And because the, the other school of thought, like the Yale people are just using them. It, it, either um, if you nebulize them or if you use them uh, topically or any other mode of, of, of a delivery, you don't get that strong immune reaction. Immune reaction. It's only when you inject them. Right, there's time for one more question over there. So, um, compared to the treatment with antibiotics, how long should the course be? Like, how long should your treatment course with your bacteria phages be? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the way, so the question is how, you know, how, how long should the course be? So you could see, I thought it was interesting that we saw such a direct uh, result just from that, with that one um, dosage. In general, the way that they used, where in places with a long history of using them, is they use them for several um, set, sort of weeks, several, several weeks. It often tends to be for a, little, a bit longer than you would use an antibiotic for. Um, and then um, it, it, sort of, it, it depends on how... I think how, how, what state the infection is in um, when you start to treat it. With a lot of work that we've done and other people have done is that if you, if you can get that infection early, you don't need to give them for very long. In fact, if you can treat a, a surface with phages, you can actually prevent any infection whatsoever if the phages are there. Whereas if you're trying to treat a really difficult um, infection, you may have to go in a few times. Um, and then people, so there's a, the early other, Institute, they have to do a lot of health tourism, and they'll, they'll tend to, people will tend to go there for, I don't know, perhaps two or three weeks to get treated. And then if they need more phages, they'll send samples, work out the strain, and the phages will be sent to them. Right, well, thank you very much, Martha. Um, I'm sure there have been, been lots more questions. I've got lots of questions. So we can carry on the conversation over some wine, which is served just behind the screen there. So please uh, hang around and, and enjoy some wine and some soft drinks as well. And um, Martha will be circulating, I hope, and yeah, very happy willing to, to answer more questions. So thank you very much, Martha. <laughs> Pleasure.